It's an honor to speak to you this morning. We live in a time of hard questions about sexuality. It's sometimes said that Wheaton College is one of the most LGBT unfriendly campuses in America. However questionable the methodology by which that charge is made, some people ask why evangelical Christians, as followers of the God of love, seem consumed with legalism, exclusion, and even hate. Isn't a person's sexuality just a fact at the core of who they are? Aren't LGBT persons children of God too? And hasn't the clear ignorance of the ancient biblical writers about sexual orientation and identity changed the interpretation of scripture? Why are those ancient prohibitions considered relevant? Why do straight Christians overlook their own sexual offenses? Why do we strain at the gnat and swallow the camel? Why do we scream about the splinter and look, tolerate the log in our own eye? And many have different questions of their own. Why is sexual purity so hard? Why bother? Why be so unrealistic when sex is so much of our, part of our culture and of our natural inclinations? The Christian church has traditionally accepted the biblical witness that sexual intimacy should be reserved for marriage. This has included the teaching that same-sex erotic intimacy is nowhere in scripture approved by God. In explaining these views, though, we're often guilty of talking right past the people that we're seeking to love. The story of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 can help us. Many who are concerned with social justice today rightly speak of Jesus embracing the marginalized and the outsider. The Samaritan woman was three times a marginalized outsider. She was a Samaritan, she was a woman, and she was a notorious sinner. And the story begins with Jesus asking for water. Now the text says that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, but Jesus did. He engages her with honesty and with care. Where we fail to engage persons who have been marginalized by their sexuality, we fail to act like Christ. Evangelicals have repentance to do on this score. But Jesus then offers the woman living water. And I want you to think with me about the three types of responses she gives as they move, she gives in resistance to his offer as they move through their interaction. She responds first by challenging his authority, asking in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? Jesus responds by elaborating, saying in verses 13 to 14, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will, be, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This intrigues the woman, so she asks for the living water. She asks for thoroughly understandable but short-sighted reasons to make her life easier, saying in verse, 13, in verse 15, Sir, give me this water so that I will not, have to, not ever be thirsty and will never have to come here again to draw water. This second kind of response, where we ask for God's gift but we ask for it on our terms, is our modern mindset too. Religion is, is after all, supposed to help us to feel better, to make us happier. But Jesus then flips the conversation. He asks her to call her husband. In verse 17, she tells him that she has no husband. This is our third kind of response. Instead of lying or retreating, she tells part of the truth. But Jesus is not satisfied with her account, so he tells her the whole truth about her life. She again challenges Jesus' authority in verse 20, as she did at first, saying that the traditions and religious perspectives of the Samaritans are just as valid as those of the Jews, that there's more than one valid perspective. But Jesus says, no, I know the truth about God. I am the truth. And finally, her reaction is different. The woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He is who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. And she goes away saying, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Not only does she believe, but so do many among the Samaritans. We are called to follow the path of the Samaritan woman, this outcast and marginalized individual among a marginalized and outcast people. Every one of us is her. Every one of us has the same temptations to resist in responding to Jesus Christ as the Samaritan woman did, by challenging or questioning his authority over our lives, by reducing the grandeur of the gospel to something that will merely help to make my life easier, or by hiding part of who we really are by telling Jesus only part of the truth about ourselves. 
Jesus Christ wants to instruct us through the teachings of the scripture what our sexuality means. Before I share my best understanding about this, since this is an, there's an inescapably personal dimension to everything we think about these things, about, about everything, I want to share with you two recent experiences that have profoundly impacted me. Just over five years ago, I entered a period of trial. I always loved my father, but I did not feel particularly close to him. He was not all that communicative, especially about matters of faith. It was not until he was in his 60s and 70s that we began to grow closer as his life grew more difficult. My mother, who, who lived her last 11 years in an increasingly difficult post-stroke condition, died suddenly in late summer of 2009. My father had prayed that God would allow him to live long enough to care for her to the end, and this was not an easy calling. I wish he had been a little bit more creative and expansive and imaginative in his prayers because God honors, honored his prayer a little too precisely to live long enough to care for my mom because he suffered a massive heart, astray, heart attack six days after her funeral. He lived for one more incredibly difficult month. After undergoing quintuple bypass and another massive heart attack, they put him in a medically induced coma and, in, and informed us kids that his kidneys had been destroyed and that he was going to die. I pulled the night shift when they woke him up from the coma. I did not know how long he would be awake or whether he would even be coherent. But he was, and I'll never forget our conversation. I told him that he was going to die and that I loved him. He squeezed my hand, and after a long silence, after a long silence, he said, It's all right. I am so very thankful. My life has been so full, and I am so blessed. I'm ready, and God is good. It was one of the last things he ever said, and he died four days later. About three weeks later, three weeks after my father's funeral, my left ring finger began to twitch. At first this was just annoying, but eventually I was concerned enough to see a neurologist, and after some tests, she looked me in the eye and said, you have Parkinson's disease. In the foggy 20 minutes that followed, I don't remember a whole lot, but I remember words like progressive brain disease, dead motor neurons, incurable, debilitating, my progression since that diagnosis exactly five years ago this month has been mercifully and even miraculously slow, but it has been continuous. My diagnosis with Parkinson's was only the first of my medical adventures. It seems like each new year brings some new medical drama, and I have to say at times I feel like a bit like a medical pinata. This has led me to ask questions such as, where is God when we are suffering? Why does he not change things that are painful and difficult? I've shaken my fist at God for what seems, what seems like the crummy, inexplicable way that he runs his universe. But at the bottom, I have not been able to shake a deep conviction, a deep conviction and experience that God is loving and good, and he is working all things to good ends. I've learned that questions like, why are you letting this happen, are legitimate but unanswerable questions. This has led me to a deep conviction that there is a question that can and must be answered in every trial. When you hit a challenge of character or a challenge of suffering, the most important to, question to ask is not why. The question the Christian must ask and answer is, how is God calling me in the face of this challenge to manifest gospel, faith, hope, and love to those around me? And from my experience with my father as he approached death, I've returned time and again to a fundamental ground of gratitude for the gift of my life in whatever form it takes from God's hand, whatever suffering is involved. Now back to sexuality. First, I want to ask you what sex is or what sex means. I suggest to you that many of us have lost or never have had a fundamentally biblical view of sexuality. Two pervasive and sometimes overlapping views about sexuality dominate popular thinking. Many in our culture have embraced a, an evolutionary naturalism view that we're simply biological accidents whose existence is fundamentally about sexual mating strategies. The, the propulsion of one's genes into the future generations is the total meaning of an other, otherwise meaningless universe. To the person who believes there's nothing but the material world, human beings are not a piece of workmanship prepackaged with meaning, but were rather purposeless breeding machines. Now more common in popular culture and increasingly common among younger believers is the idea that our sexuality is fundamental to our identity. 
Matthew Vines, a young gay man who identifies himself as an evangelical Christian, is one of the persuasive voices today for the full acceptance of LGBT persons in, our, in the church. And I believe that the nub of his argument is that because sexual identity is the core of who we are, and because we feel incomplete without expressing our sexual identities, Scripture must be interpreted as accepting of monogamous gay relationships because that is what, what LGBT persons require to feel complete. His train of reasoning starts with the assumption of the centrality of sexual identity. But I want to question whether sexual identity or other forms of identity can actually stand as the foundations of our identity. What am I? Who am I? What am I made for? C.S. Lewis once said, the first qualification for judging any piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral is to know what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it is meant to be used. We are God's workmanship. Who and what are we? What is our purpose? The first thing that God says about human beings in Genesis is that we're made in the image of God. My deepest calling, no matter what God gives me in life, is to point others to God through my life. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, the purpose of an icon is not to be an, an object of worship, but rather to be a material, symbolic window through which a spiritual truth is seen. Our lives are to have an iconic quality. My calling is for my life to be a window for others to see a deeper reality of God. But how does this relate to our sexuality? Genesis 1 begins with the testimony that in the beginning God created. We have, to under, we have to ground our understanding of every part of God's creation, including our sexuality, in an understanding of the nature of God. Christians understand God to be one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has not chosen to reveal why he created the physical cosmos or humanity, but Christian theologians have long understood that his acts of creation flow from his very nature as a loving Trinitarian God. Because God has existed and always will exist in a perfect, eternal, and timeless love relationship within the Trinity, the Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father, together in the power and through the love of the Holy Spirit, because God is love, God created the physical world and humanity as an act of self-giving love. Human beings, male and female, are created as the pinnacle of creation. In Genesis 1.27, we're told the most fundamental truth about what it means to be human. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I don't think the total meaning of being made in the image of God is exhausted by our sexuality, but it's striking that the first truth about what it means to be made in the image of God that's stated in Scripture is maleness and femaleness. Human beings are created in the image of God. Our physical existence as living beings is blessed by God, and God's creational intent was for the fundamental binary of maleness and femaleness to mark our existence. But Adam and Eve were not merely physical image bearers. The first human beings were sexual beings. God bid them to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 28, 128. And we immediately learn that the man and woman are to become one flesh in marriage, Genesis 2, 24. And this appears to be part, if only part, of the fundamental meaning of what it means to be made in the image of God. The first man and woman, together in the first marriage, were to mirror in and through their bodies in marriage the diversity and unity of God's own nature and being, as well as God's attributes of creativity and fecundity. One of the ways in which God means for humanity to bear his image on earth is through married lives that demonstrate unity and community. This is made explicit in the, in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul declares the eternal purpose of marriage between a man and a woman is for marriage to serve as a symbol. Paul quotes Genesis in Ephesians 5, 31, saying, a man and a woman shall become one flesh. And then he goes on to say, this mystery is profound, but I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. Do we get that? The union of marriage refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is to symbolize to a watching world the passionate love of God for Christ, God in Christ for his bride, his people. Signs and symbols never exhaustively represent what they represent. Our sexuality is constrained, it's determined, it's limited by our bio biological givenness of our maleness and femaleness. But with all of its limitations, marriage points to God. But, lest we symbolize marriage, we have to think positively and properly about singleness. 
While marriage is an important symbol on this earth of the heavenly love between Christ and his church, Jesus tells us in Luke 20 that marriage is only for this life. Further, unmarried individuals are meant to be living symbols or images of God. Christians believe that the single man, Jesus Christ, was and is the true and perfect image of the one true God. Jesus, as a single man, raised up spiritual children and modeled intimate companionship with the very people he came to serve. Singleness is a symbol of the spiritual age inaugurated with the coming of Christ and awaiting fulfillment in the second coming. Singles serve the church as visible reminders that the kingdom of God points away from any worldly idealization or idolatry of marriage and family. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that it is good for the unmarried and the widows to remain single, echoing Jesus' call to singleness in Christ's kingdom. The Christian narrative portrays godly marriage and godly singleness as equally valid manifestations of walking in the image of God. And one of the great weaknesses of our evangelical church is our failure to value singleness. Rather than sex having no intrinsic meaning, as the evolutionary naturalists would say, or rather than sexual desire or, orient or orientation being the cornerstone on which to build our human identity, as others would say, the Christian faith would tell us to, that our sexuality is given to us for a purpose, for the purpose of our lives pointing beyond ourselves through the way we conduct our lives to the eternal character and nature of God. Even though human sinfulness has introduced rebellion, twistedness, and brokenness into our sexuality, sin can never erase the fundamental goodness of our sexuality. Our sexuality may be pervasively, pervasively broken and a profound struggle, but God is at work redeeming our sexuality in Christian marriage and in Christian singleness. He does this through the guidance of his revealed will for our moral lives as found in the scriptures and through the redeeming work of the Holy Spirit in purifying and transforming our lives. The complex reality of the foundational goodness of our sexuality, even as our sexuality is twisted and in need of transformation by God's redeeming power, these realities create tension for us. Christians are called to live in that tension. One of the best expressions of this comes from a summary of the thought of Pope John the Paul II about sexuality. John Paul believed at the core that to be human is to be a moral agent. That in turn meant that we live in a human universe, the very structure of which is dramatic. And hear carefully this, this sentence. The great drama of any life is the struggle to surrender the person that I am to the person that I ought to be. The great drama of any life is the struggle to surrender the person that I am to the person that I ought to be. My understanding of the person that I ought to be, my identity, your identity, should be formed by the calling to be the image of God in the world. We are asked hard questions. Why should I live in discord with my desires? Why can't I just accept who I am? These are the kind of questions that Christians must answer through the witness of our lives and the witness of our words. It is here in answering these questions that the experiences of the death of my father and, the, and my diagnosis with Parkinson's have had a profound impact on me. I now approach the subject of sexuality in general and the experience of people who experience other kinds of sexual attraction with gay and lesbian friends with a deepened sense of what it means to bear a challenge that I did not ask for, a challenge that sets me apart from others. I know more now what it means to beg God to change something and for my prayers not to be answered. I have a deepened sense of what, uh, that I am called to manifest God, God's faith and hope and love in the midst of the gift of my life exactly as it is. I am to do so with godly the kind of godly gratitude that my, that my father manifested as he died and as I open my hands to receive life in whatever form and what, with whatever constraints that God happens to give. We are called to love like Jesus. He is all love, but his love is hard-hitting, sharp-edged, and demanding. He calls for us to forsake everything and to follow him so that we might gain the whole world. To the hard questions about our sexuality, his answer is not for us to form a pri primary identity around any finite gift, whether our sexuality or our vocations or our appearance or our possessions or our artistic gifts or anything, but to form our identity around our infinite calling to the one to whom we are an image. He calls us to link arms with all of his children in common identity of being made in God's image, even as we confess our brokenness. 
He promises that everything that we lose in embracing that identity will be swallowed up by the abundance of life everlasting promised by Jesus. We are meant to be living, finite, biological models of spiritual truth, whether we're living as chaste singles or in biblical marriage. God is the ultimate reality, and our call on this earth is to conform our lives to be a reflection of His greater reality. He alone can tell us what form this should take. We are not free to set our own standards. I pray that as He did in the life of the Samaritan woman at the well, that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself will transcend our rejection of His authority when we turn away from the clear teachings of Scripture. I pray that He will show us where we are trivializing His calling in our life by interpreting His will through our understanding what will make us happy, that He will open our blind eyes to the truth of the brokenness of our lives so that we can receive the water of life everlasting from Him. Married or single, gay or straight, chaste or promiscuous, transgender or cisgender or queer, gender queer or gender baffled, tortured or, and conflicted or dazed and confused, virgin or veteran, addicted to pornography or naive as a newborn child, regardless of your experience, the basic truth about your sexuality and of the sexuality of everyone around you is that your sexuality is a gift from God. We are the stewards, not the owners of that gift. The gift giver has plans for this gift. You can show gratitude for the gift of your sexuality and love for the gift giver by, giving, by using the gift to witness to the reality of God in, in whose image we are made. If we choose to abuse the gift of our sexuality, or if we take some aspect of this gift as, as the center of our lives, we distort or hinder our relationship with God, and we distort and hinder our growth as loving persons. This was the attitude of the Apostle Paul when he said in Philippians 3, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Savior. I believe that God is calling Wheaton College as a Christian community to continue with the historical church to testify to the biblical understanding of sexual morality. But I also believe that God is calling us to an expanded understanding of, of sexuality that's more biblically based. We need to repent of those times of in, when in ignorance or insensitivity we have failed to love our brothers and sisters, but we cannot repent for faithfulness to the Bible's vision of sexuality or of sexual morality. But I would urge that we're not just to stand with history. I pray that the Wheaton College community will make history by being a place that truly embraces the whole scriptural truth about our sexuality that becomes a community that truly loves those who are attracted to the same sex, including those who identify as gay or lesbian or others. I pray we strengthen and encourage one, other, uh, one another to faithful life in Christ, including the pursuit together of our full sanctification and transformation. I pray that we become a community with a robust vision of wholesome and joyous singleness while celebrating the beauty of marriage. I invite you to join us this afternoon at 3.30 in the Phelps Room in the Lower Beamer Center for the next session of our campus sexuality living room discussions. I would love to participate in a dialogue with you. Let me close this in prayer. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those things that shall endure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.